Hello again, everybody. This is Steve coming to you with another puzzle. Uh, this is probably going to be my last one for a while, uh, mostly because I just I don't have anything ready yet. Uh, as far as the other ones are concerned, I've got other puzzles that I'm working on, but I don't have them solved yet, or I don't have a good way to describe my logic behind doing what I did. So I've just decided that it's probably best to hold off on those until I uh, get those figured out, and then I'll come back to them with, or come back to you with them. Uh, as far as other videos, I got more coming. Uh, it's just that the puzzles are are done for right now. I've got the primary ones done that that I'm able to do right now. So the stuff that will be coming next will be from my uh, from some of my book writing work and other things like that. So stay tuned for those. But anyways, as far as this one, this puzzle goes, the question with this one is how do you provide pressurized hot and cold water to a cabin or other off-grid structure to facilitate or make possible a running shower that does not require either electricity or natural gas pro slash propane to run it. In other words, you're not running electricity to heat it. You're not running electricity to pump it. You're not using gas or propane to heat it, etc., etc., like that. Basically, it has to be pressurized and heated naturally in a completely mechanical way, whatever way you choose to do. Uh, anyways... My thought with this one, and for all, well, of course, let me back uh, back that up. For any of you who have gone camping, you know about these. Uh, base, they're they're a basic camp shower, and you know they're they're five gallons. They you stick them out on a tree or in a uh, on a pole or something. Then in the sunlight, the sunlight comes down, hits this black material. Uh, the sun. You know, the sun heats the water, you turn the valve, and off it goes. The problem with them is five gallons does not last long. You get like about a two to three minute shower. Uh, it's ne not ne necessarily very warm water, and it doesn't have a lot of pressure. So it's, it's more or less what I would call a beach shower. It's enough to wash the sand off and you're done. Uh, so not really practical, especially if it's a more permanent structure like a cabin. If you're just camping in the woods, this is great to have. Uh, if you're in a more permanent structure, you want something a little more permanent as far as the shower goes. Plus, these don't work in the winter. And if you're up in a cabin in the winter, these aren't going to work. Or if you, you know, you're basically going to at that point in time be relegated to sponge baths. And that's, you know, sometimes you want that good hot shower. Uh, so here's my thought for how to facilitate that. That right there is a gas hot water heater. Now you're thinking, wait, didn't you just say that we can't have propane or natural gas to heat it? Yes, I didn't say you couldn't use the hot water heater. I just said you couldn't use propane and natural gas to heat it. Here's my thinking with this. This right here is a good quality uh, pressure vessel that can be heated with uh, you know, a high temperature heat source. It does not necessarily have to be propane. They're designed for propane, but doesn't have to be propane. Um, you could take like you could take all this electronics and other stuff off the unit and stick a little fire pit or fire box or something down below it and and heat the water that way and I'll show you my thinking of how this is gonna play into the whole uh, hot water thing because now you're also probably wondering well that's great you can heat it but how are you gonna make it work in the shower again I'll show you that in just a second here Starting our starting the puzzle, uh, we're we're looking basically at the actual uh, shower apparatus. This can be anything from a, a hose with a spray head strapped to a tree, and you standing out in the weather, all a la, a la natural, traumatizing the squirrels. <laughs> I know you could put up a shower curtain, or you could build something a bit more permanent. And if it's a cabin, which this would you, which this would be best for, because you know if you're just camping at a camp spot. You know, if it's a natural wild place or something like that, this isn't going to be practical. If it's something that's a more permanent structure like a cabin, then this is practical. Anyways, uh, if you're going to, you know, and if you're going to have this, you should have a shower house and have things like, you know, in, for in the summer, you want to have like little vent doors at the bottom and at the top so that cooler air could come in there and you're not sweating yourself to death while you're taking a warm shower. Uh, get, you know, get a little air circulation in there and stuff like that. And in the winter, you close those, put a couple oil lamps in there, preheat the shower uh, before you get in there. You know, turn those off, and then uh, and then turn around and 
fire up the shower and off you go. Of course, you know, that assumes you've already preheated it. But anyways, going back to the hot water heaters, what we'll want to make this system work is we'll want to have first the hot side, which this is raised up for, you know, because you're going to have to put heat under it. And this is the cold side, which can sit on the ground because it doesn't need anything under it. It's going to be the cold water. Then you have the the hot water, or you know, hot water, the, uh, what am I thinking of? The, oh, fire pit. You're going to have a little fire pit under here, fire ring, something that you can put fire into, like wood or charcoal or whatever, to create the heat needed to heat the hot water side. Now, if you're going to use this in the winter, you're probably also going to want to have this or this fire pit under here. And the reason for that is not because, you know, you're going to create a double hot side. What you're going to do is in the winter, the cold side is going to freeze. So you're probably going to want to you're probably going to want to preheat that before you use it. So if you're going to use it in the winter and not drain this thing out and leave it and come back in the spring, uh, well, even if you yeah, if you if you're leaving it in the fall, you drain it and then come back in the spring and fill it back up and use it again. Then you don't need the heater underneath it. But if you're going to be using it during the winter, you're going to want to have this under both sides. And this one only needs enough to warm it up to oh, you know, 50, 60 degrees. So, you know, basically melt all the ice inside and th thaw it enough to make it usable. Uh, so something to consider. If you're down in a warm climate where that's not a problem, pff, set it on the ground, it won't freeze. Or if it does freeze a little bit, when it starts running, that'll thaw out. But anyways, the, other th the next thing you have is you have the, the water in, or the water outflow, which, you know, the, on a normal hot water heater, that's going to be the water that's going to go out. This is going to be the water where the water would normally come in. And this right here is a dip tube, and the reason for that is because when the you know when it's running off of normal house water, you're gonna have you're gonna want to have all the cold water coming in here come down to the bottom near the heat plate, get warmed up, and then the warm water is gonna float to the top and come out here. And it this what this one being like this with no dip tube allows for the hot water heater to you know to fill up and all of the all of the uh, you know, all the air that's in here to go away so that the, the uh, tank is fully filled all the way to the top and there's no air bubbles or anything like that that can cause boiling and steam and other things like that. This is your pressure uh, your pressure relief valve. If you're wondering what that is, that's a pressure release valve. That sits on the top and usually in the center of the tank or if it's a, hot, if it's a gas hot water heater, it's usually going to sit somewhere to the side or, you know, off, off center from the, you know, at the top. Uh, but either way, the point is, like in this case, this one's rated to 30 PSI. At 31 PSI, it's going to open up and, you know, water's going to come gushing out of here. And if you have like an extension, it's going to come out of that extension, go over, go down, and drain onto the floor until the pressure goes down and it'll close again. Uh, that you want to leave in place on your on this system because... You know, you don't have any other controls to regulate the pressure in here, and that's kind of your emergency release in case, it, you know, in case the pressure gets too high in the tank. You don't want your tank turning into a gigantic water grenade. So that will keep it at 30 PSI or below. Um, the next step is to take this and connect it in like this. You're gonna have you're gonna connect you know and this this looks like it's backwards and if it's a normal house setup it's backwards, uh, but in this case, what you need is you need to have uh, yeah you're gonna have all your hot water float to the top admittedly so you're gonna get your cold water down here, but since you don't have a water you know a water source or something else coming in this side and needing to come down here, the water's got to go out some or the uh, water's got to come out of the tank somehow. So you use the dip tube side, the, the, you know, the water inflow side to be your water outflow. It goes out, goes down, goes to your, nor to your shower, to your hot and cold side, and then you get your normal, you know, your normal hot and cold water that way. Uh, they, this here, you would add an extension with a on-off valve. So you can close this when it's in operation and open it when you need to refill it. Because event, there's, since there's no reg regular inflow of water, you're going to need a way to refill this. So having that little valve be, you know, would be where you can close it that's a you know that's a good thing or if you have a valve where you can close it you can you know you can build up the pressure in here and then you can open it later and 
depressurize it and fill it back up and stuff like that. So this would have, you know, like I say, just like a little extension and a uh, like a ball valve to close it off when it needs to be building pressure. But anyways, water comes in and hot water, you know, the water here boils and it pushes the hot water up this pipe over, down, and in. But how does the cold side do this? Now, you can, if you want to, hook a pressure, you know, like if you have like a windmill pressure, uh, windmill, windmill compressor, which that would still qualify for fully mechanical, you could hook it into this side, hook it into this side, set it at like 28 PSI, and you have, you know, obviously the hot water's heating up here, and that's partially helping to pump the water, and then you have the high pressure air from your, comp your windmill compressor system pushing the rest of it out, you know, hey, la di da you're all set. But with mine, I'm assuming I don't have that windmill compressor. So what do I do to actually pressurize the cold water side? Since the hot water side is going to pressurize itself already, but you want to keep the cold side cold. You create a crosslink so that as the water heats up in here and it boils, it builds steam, and that pressure can come up into here, push on this water, and out it goes and into your system. Now, that's all fine and dandy, but when this is all said and done, how do you refill it? You add a T. And you have, uh, you probably have like a shutoff valve here. You, know, you still got your shutoff valve here and your shutoff valve here. Goes up to here and probably a shutoff valve over here. And this would go out to whatever you want to use to fill this. Like I had a, uh, when I was a kid, we went down and did some uh, missions work in the Appalachian Mountains. It was an old mining town. The town had shut down and everybody there was just dirt, dirt poor. Because, uh, I mean, they were really rich before the mine shut down. And then when the mine shut down, everybody lost everything and they became like just dirt poor. So we went down there to help them. And one of the places we were at had an outdoor, uh, had an outdoor shower and it was a series of like little shower stalls. And the problem with it was, yeah, we had water up the hill. It was, it was about the hill was like about 30 feet tall so we had uh let's see well if it's 10 let's see 0.4 for every foot so you're gonna have four pounds for every 10. that's well, okay we would have had about four pounds of uh or 12 pounds of line pressure in our shower and uh probably more like 10 if you once you consider you know where the shower is positioned at versus the floor so 10 PSI, it wasn't a great shower. It was cold as all get on. I mean, middle of summer, 80 degrees outside. We're freezing to death taking showers. It was it was crazy. But uh, yeah, we had that. It was all running water. And the only time you got warm water was if you were the first person in the shower. And that didn't tend to last very long. <laughs> but uh, anyways, the uh, you know this system could be charged either manually like if you want to pump it in there by hand if you want if you got something that's a higher up like a water tank and you want to just use gravity you could take the pressure valves here flip them open and let the tank fill up and i recommend too if you're doing this and you know going back to the uh let's see here going back that okay if you've got the kind that has the the lines on the side for the for the in for the in or outflow and the inflow you could run a small pipe out run another cross pipe and put a little sight glass in there you could also add your pressure gauge in there because the pressure gauge will apply to everything uh, because once you have the once you have the uh, get it there once you have the two sides tied in like this it's, you know, everybody's going to have the same pressure across the system because it's going to be self-balancing. So you could take, like, uh, your outside water supply. Uh, if, you, if you don't have a way to pump it in there, you could put, like, a extension out here with a little funnel, and you just get up on a, you get up on a, a, a small ladder or stairs or something and pour water into that funnel and have somebody hold open one of these. Or, you know, if you get one that has the... Uh, where you can actually lock them open. You know, you could just lock it open, start pouring water, and wait till the water comes off the top, and that valve close that, good, and uh, you know, maybe do the same thing with the other one. You know, there, there's a bunch of different ways you could do that, but 
you know, there's there's different ways that you can uh, set up the system. You know, whatever's easiest for you. Uh, if you want to get creative and wild, you could, you know, you could, like I say, you can run this with uh, compressed air off of a off a windmill compressor. If you have a ram pump, you know, if you have a ram pump, you could actually uh, go back to the original layout for hot water heater. Uh, let's see. There it is. Okay, you could actually go back to the original layout and you could have the ram pump pumping water into this side and the hot water coming out this side and then ram pump pumping into this side, cold water coming out this side and down to your shower. So, But again, you got to make sure that if you're doing that, your ram pump has sufficient capacity or you're going to have a very weak shower. Uh, if you're if you're pumping up to a storage tank that's providing your your cabin with full full house pressure, uh, I think it's 45 psi is considered full cabin pressure uh, or full house pressure. Although these are only rated at 30 psi, so you might uh, have your stuff dialed back to 25 psi, depending. Uh, 45 is normal pressure, uh, but sometimes you can get house pressure set up where it's only 25 psi and still do the job. So, you know, like I said, that's why you also have different hot water heaters with different uh, pressure relief uh, pressures on the top. But uh, anyways, you know, like I said, there's, there's a lot of different ways you can do this. Uh, look at what you have. Experiment with it. If you don't want to do the hot water heater, uh, what you could do is you could get, and they do have these. If, if we go back to the... Go back, go back. There we go. If we go back to this, you can buy just tanks like this to have an outlet on the bottom and an outlet on the top. No pressure release, you'd have to put that somewhere in line, you know, going back to this inner link here. You would probably have to put a pressure release probably up here. So, you know, since it's a since you're going to have the these two connected together, you'd have the pressure release up here. Uh, now if you're like I said if you're running compressed air to pressurize this, uh, then you don't need that because uh, you know the system as long as the system's set at a certain rate and you got a regulator that's only allowing so much pressure then you know then you shouldn't have to worry about that uh, that pressure relief valve still probably a good idea to have it in case like the regulator decides to have a bad day it derps out on you and suddenly your your uh, house water pressure goes from 25 psi to 70 you know and you're going to want that Thing to sit there and go and let you know that something just very bad something very bad just happened and you need to deal with it before something even worse happens so again not something you're probably going to have to worry about but just things i'm throwing out there as things for you to think about because i don't want to have you know come back six months from now and find out one of y'all blew yourself up trying to set up this system and you know because i didn't mention these little considerations so and i'm not you know i'm not necessarily giving you all of the considerations when it comes to uh Thing, safety things you should be thinking about. Uh, you know, it, it's going to really be a case-to-case -case basis, and you definitely want to be sure you're con you're thinking of every possible consideration, every possible thing that can go wrong. Because if Murphy's going, if Murphy is going to show up and bring his law with him, he's going to, you know, he's going to bring friends. So you need to pretty much idiot-proof the system as much as you can. Because, you know, and it may not be for you, it may be for a relative who comes in and doesn't know how the system works. Uh, they might, you know, you might tell them, yeah, just light a fire under the hot water side, give it 20 minutes, check your temperature valve, which, you know, you could actually even install, uh, like on one of these, if there's a place to install it, you can install a temperature valve, or not temperature valve, temperature gauge, excuse me. You can install a temperature gauge that... Uh, you know, the temperature gauge shows you what the temperature is and you tell them when it gets up to this point, then you can go take a shower and, and stuff like that. But again, be sure when you do it that you idiot proof it because like I say, Murphy will show up and, and, and idiots are very good at, and I'm not calling any of your friends or relatives idiots. I'm just saying there's always going to be that one person, whoever it is, friend, neighbor, stranger or whatever, that's going to find a way to hurt themselves while while using the system that, or do something stupid or break it or whatever so you want to you want to outthink everybody else and make sure you've covered all the bases when you build this because you know there's and think about it this way there there might be a morning when you wake up you haven't had your coffee you go out you fire the system up 
and you do something monumentally stupid because the coffee hasn't kicked in yet. So you're going to be idiot proofing it from yourself as well. And I, I throw myself in that pile too, because, you know, if I haven't had my morning coffee, I do some really stupid things. Uh, I, you know, the stupid usually stops after the coffee kicks in, but before the coffee kicks in, there's a, I, you know, I am very skilled at doing really stupid things. So I'm just, that's more what I'm thinking. Cause they're, cause we're all human. You're going to have that moment and you know, it, you've, you will have that moment. Your family will have that moment. Your friends will have that moment. Every human on this planet is going to have that moment at least once a day. So you have to consider that when you're building the systems like this. But anyways, I hope this has helped you guys, uh, given you some creative ideas for things. Maybe you've got a better way to do this. If you do, I'm game for that. Uh, you know, like I like I mentioned in a previous video, you could, you know, there's air-powered water pumps out there. So if you had a water source and you wanted to make this entirely mechanical, you could use that air-powered water pump and none of what I've done here would be necessary. You could run the hot water out the normal way, the cold water out the normal way, bring the the cold water in on both of them in a normal way and off you go and if you don't have that this is another alternative to get what you need uh, but you know your mileage may vary and you know to each his own but anyways this is this is how I would do it and if you guys have any questions concerns comments other thoughts please let me know thanks